me start by um, recognizing uh, Senator Amy Marcos, who's joining us today. Hello. And um, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. I, I won't uh, mention everyone because uh, most of you who are actually with us um, in this uh, um, WebEx meeting are actually all going to speak. No? So I'll, I'll uh, introduce you when you speak. But um, <clears throat> just um, to put on record, this is a this is the Senate um, Committee on um, Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation, and Future Thinking, and we are tackling Senate Resolution Number 393 on Futures Thinking and the New Normal, Senate Resolution Number 413 on the Future of Education in the New Normal. Um, specifically, we are um, going to listen to ideas, to concepts, to future platforms, uh, future alternatives for education. I also want to clarify that the Committee on Basic Education, Committee on Higher Education have their own hearings. So the objective of this hearing is really to look into the future. So bear with me um, for the resource persons and, and um, speakers that um, if you focus on basic matters, which I feel should be in the hearing of uh, the two other committees, I will just point that out because um, I don't want to have to overlap. No, we, I want to use our time wisely. We only have two hours, in fact, uh, an hour and 55 minutes. Um, and that is why I really want to look into the future. I'm not even sure if we will be able to call on every resource person. I'm very excited to hear ideas. And so if um, there's a big chance that we will have a part two on, on uh, the future of education alone. Um, but let's get started. And... Um, Hold on one second. Okay, I'd just like to, um, before I start again, um, this particular hearing is an ongoing hearing of this committee on various sustainable development goals, various aspects of life that are affected. So today we focus on education and thus it is a joint hearing with the Committee on Education, Committee on Basic Education, and I believe also higher education. So on that note, um, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, I think it's available on YouTube for you, those of you who, most of you I think are very specific to education, but we had very interesting guests on Futures Thinking in the last hearings. And uh, uh, if anyone wants access to those um, uh, online, uh, if they were taped, I believe, uh, please let our staff know and we can share that with you. So. I always, I, I am a believer that a crisis presents opportunities for us. And instead of us um, dwelling on all the difficulties that we have encountered, as there are many, and whether we like it or not, we need to dwell on them. Uh, it's important we also take time out to look into how we can deal with the future and what this future looks like. So I would like to start with a very short video. It's just one minute. And it speaks for itself. And right after that, I will ask the principal of the school that was featured here um, to say a few words about that project. This uh, video that I'm about to show um, has gone viral worldwide. It was uh, shown in uh, Western countries. It was also shown in India, uh, in um, Eastern European countries as well. So may I ask the secretary to play the video? Outstanding performance in communication. Mark Allen D. With honor. <laughs> We are conducting now the cyber graduation of uh, 179 of our public school students and uh, of course our parents and our students got their wishes uh, come through today with the holding of the cyber graduation as part of the safe city agenda of Mayor Lino Cayetano in Taguig City. We know 
as a former students that education and AI is something that will be life. It's a very momentous event that you want you want to wanna miss, and uh, we would like to make sure that our student will not miss it. Dr. Lumang, George Tyson po. Hi, Ma'am Joy. Robotic graduation in Taguig. Sir, I think you're on mute. Uh, copy that, ma'am. But I was also told to discuss the teacher's training and the uh, open campus in Taguig City. Is that correct? Hello? Yes, sir. Um, but um, we initially uh, played the video of the Tagi graduation. So okay. if you could just speak about it first, um, okay. then maybe we can call uh, when Senator Pia comes online. Um, she can call you again later. Call sure. you again later. Okay. I'm okay. back, sir. I'm back, everyone. I'm back. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Hi, um, Senator. Okay. And I don't know why. Yeah, sorry, I don't know what happened, but um, I'm back. And uh, we just need um, George Tison, the principal of uh, Taguig Science, um, Taguig uh, Rene Cayetano Science and Technology High School, to just give us a very brief background on that graduation. Now, that, just that, because later on we'll call you on the other aspects. Thank you. I just wanted to start out this way because it's graduation season. I just wanted to, to start on a good note. Keep it, keep it short, lang, uh, Doc George, on that point. Okay, uh, Madam Senator, good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Uh, uh, regarding the cyber graduation that we had in Senator Renato Cayetano Science and Technology High School, 
Uh, ginawa po yan ng ating mga robotics team from the school. It is composed of seven uh, robotics students who come up with the idea to have a cyber graduation for the class of 179 for a batch of school year 2020. And uh, we presented the idea to the city education office and uh, we had a performance test and then we asked the permission of the Department of Education and uh, Mayor Lino Cayetano to go on with it. And uh, we were supported by Mayor Lino. So the robotics team, the kids, came out with four robots that represented the 179 graduates. And uh, uh, we, had a, we had a tablet or an iPad placed at the face of the robots to represent the graduates who are on live streaming, uh, sitting at the comfort of their home with their family while watching the graduation. And uh, it was uh, shown live on Facebook uh, as part of our e-graduation program in the city of Taguig. And fortunately, it went well. Our parents uh, are very happy about it and our students are very proud about it. And of course, the DepEd Taguig City and the City Education Office is also very proud, Madam Senator, because it was shown in more than 15 countries all over the world, including uh, the Good Morning America show in the United States of America. And we're very glad that it happened and it represented Taguig City. So we're very fortunate that we were able to represent the city of Taguig as the city of education and technology and the Philippines as well. Salamat, salamat, Dr. George Tison. Thank you, ma'am. On, on that note, like I said, I just wanted to start with something exciting, something that uh, showed that our students and a public school at that are uh, learning rob robotics and have been able to put it to good use. Um, let's now start with, uh, um, we'll start very quickly with the uh, uh, government agencies, starting with Department of Education. May I ask that you keep it very short and focus only on the future. Don't give us a background anymore about COVID and that we have to take health precautions. We already know that, no? I'm really looking at what does the future look like? In fact, ideally five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. How do we prepare our students? How do we prepare the teachers? That is really the discussion I like. And like I said earlier, I'd really like to focus on the ideas of others, um, the teachers themselves. We invited Metro Bank, Metro Bank awardees. We invited um, teachers and um, um, experts in the profession from different areas. But let's start first with DepEd. So um, it's a, um, I don't have, the name of the person here, but I believe it is a Yusek. Yusek, which Yusek is here? Sorry, I don't have the name unless I'm missing a, a list. But please proceed, Dep Ed. Hello, Ma Madam Chair, uh, this is Under Secretary Nepo Malaluan. Can I be heard? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Please proceed, um, Yusek Nepo. Yes, magandang hapon, Madam Chair, and uh, the honorable members of the Senate that are present this afternoon. Uh, as uh, mentioned by the Chair, I will skip the uh, slides uh, talking about uh, the adjustments that the department has made in light of COVID, but just to note that uh, uh, in light of the expected restrictions and disruptions on physical opening of schools, uh, as the Honorable Chair is well aware, the department has developed a basic education learning continuity plan uh, with the objective of finding ways to provide safe and healthy learning opportunities for our children in time of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but this uh, uh, learning continuity plan, Madam Chair, we do not take this as a standalone emergency response. It is anchored on the department's pivot to quality uh, through our current program, Sulong Edukalidad. And we also want uh, this LCP to bridge into the future of uh, education. Uh, on slide 19, uh, I'll start with that. Uh, Madam Chair, even before COVID-19 struck, the Department of Education was already about to set up 
an education futures unit. And by happenstance, it was mentioned by the secretary uh, during a budget hearing that the honorable chair was presiding uh, in the last budget process. Uh, and uh, this uh, concept and uh, plan by the department actually got the support of the chair. And the vision of the secretary in creating this unit is for us to have a, a, a an agile unit that will be able to prepare uh, and not really to predict its desired output is to identify, understand, and influence the key driving forces for change uh, towards a desired outcome. We envision this unit to be an innovation center and, uh, uh, and that its work will uh, naturally be disruptive because it will challenge the existing assumptions and provide out-of-the-box uh, solution to basic education's pressing problems and uh, challenges. Presently, Madam Chair, this unit is working with two teams. One is led by Dr. Brillantes of UP and CIPAG, and the other is led by Dr. Sherilyn Monterola of the UP College of Education. And in fact, the uh, succeeding slides uh, from slides 22 onwards that I will show are mainly arising from an ongoing scoping study by Dr. Monterola. So what is in the COVID-19 horizon uh, for education? And uh, we start with a, uh, with a, a principle on, on how to approach uh, this, what is in the horizon. Uh, if UNESCO has the learning to become as a principle for uh, the futures of education, what we are adopting in the unit is a learning to flourish principle, uh, which emphasizes the ability of an individual to prosper or thrive, regardless whether circumstances are favorable or challenging. And it, uh, we hope that uh, this uh, aspiration to flourish uh, become the embodiment of the aspirations of every Filipino learner. Uh, the goals of uh, the of what we envision for education for every learner is uh, uh, on the uh, part of the agency of the learner, uh, the ability to act independently and to make choices freely and pursue goals persistently. In fact, uh, at the beginning of the term of Secretary Briones, uh, her agenda she included not just quality. Uh, accessible basic education, but she also included there the word liberating basic education for all. And that emphasizes the idea of agency, uh, of an ability to the learner to act independently and make choices freely. Uh, of course, there is also work readiness, uh, having the durable skills and multiliteracies that will make learners thrive or prosper in the future jobs. Uh, but we also want uh, responsible uh, citizens and proactive citizens uh, that encompasses both local, global, and digital citizenship. Uh, the idea of human flourishing is uh, to be able to, uh, for the education sector to assist in uh, developing a complete human uh, well-being uh, which means one who is self-realized and fully functioning and purposely engaged in different aspects of uh, life. In other words, one that uh, is able to flourish on independently on one's own. Uh, next slide. Uh, the key areas uh, that uh, guided by the future goals of education and the uh, uh, life learning framework, uh, the Education Futures Unit intends to work in the near term on the following key areas. Next slide, please. Uh, on exploring technologies for remote learning, on reframing the curriculum, on anticipating educational opportunities from innovations, and on reinforcing learning sciences, assessments, analytics, and knowledge uh, mobilization. Uh, next slide. The area of Exploring technologies for remote learning, Madam Chair, is very relevant at the present uh, situation. One of the key areas that we would like to focus on is to explore a multitude of technologies for remote learning, given our current technological challenges. And uh, 
In other words, the idea is always that remote learning will uh, have to be uh, digital and online in nature, but given our limitations, we need to really uh, enhance and explore uh, many technologies for remote learning given uh, uh, the challenges that we face. Uh, uh, and uh, this, the list uh, only offers some of the areas that we can uh, explore. Uh, next slide. On the area of reframing the curriculum, uh, uh, we have here uh, the idea of uh, prioritizing essential and cross-cutting knowledge skills and mindsets. Uh, so this includes the developing 21st century competencies that cut, cut across subject areas through integrative and, in, and transdisciplinary approaches. Uh, today, Madam Chair, uh, we're still doing the subject-by-subject uh, -subject, uh, approach in teaching, but uh, more and more uh, there needs to be a, a prioritization of the curriculum on cross-cutting knowledge and uh, skills. Uh, the second is to embed multiliteracies. Uh, the pandemic uh, has shown that multiliteracy, such as information, scientific, health, financial, and civic literacies are important for people to uh, respond to the crisis. So when citizens have uh, multiple literacies uh, that are functioning, they have better understanding of, uh, for example, how the COVID-19 uh, is spread, uh, where they are more critical about the information they receive, uh, and they have a sharper sense of the social responsibility and are more capable of dealing with uh, financial shocks at, as we are uh, Yusek, experiencing now. Yusek, I'd just like to make yes, a comment. Madam Chair. Your, your, your presentation is very interesting. I just want to make a comment because when you move on, you might have something else that I, and I'll forget this one. Two things I want to point out. When you talk about um, um, embedded multiliteracies, you, know, you mentioned information and how the students need to process this. May I just make a recommendation that um, I don't know what age it is appropriate, no? maybe whether it's 10 years old, 12, 15, I don't know. I have a 10-year-old. And I'm, I, I'm trying to help him discern how to appreciate information out there. Because when we were growing up, it was very simple. Eh? You read the news, and more or less you can assume that what you read in the news is fairly accurate. No, There's always dissenting opinions, but it's fairly accurate. Now, there's like all kinds of information exploding before you. So I want to be sure that in your curriculum, you also start teaching these kids how to understand information, how to filter it, because no less than WHO says that in the fight against this pandemic, information, understanding the right information, information dissemination is very important. So I've never heard a discussion wherein I hear about our concern that we teach our kids about um, um, being uh, the, the right uh, GMRC online, no? but how to process this information, how they on their own they can they can um, uh, try to understand what is correct information and not. I have not heard that. So can you just include that, no, in your um, in the in the implementation of this embedded multiliteracies? That's one point. Um, uh, the second the second point I want to raise is um, um, is it is it part of embedded multiliteracies or cross cutting? cross-cutting knowledge and skills where you talked about uh, the importance of um, uh, teaching. Like you said, right now, we, we teach our subjects individually, but we will need to cross, cross. Um, uh, what was the term that you use? Which, which word does that fall under? That, that's where my next comment is. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, more, more integrative and transdisciplinary approaches to teaching. Sanyan, Sanyan. Uh, in the prioritizing essential and cross-cutting knowledge, skills, and mindset, Madam Chair. Okay, so on that point, no, on more in, on, on a more integrative approach and uh, um, cross-disciplinary um, um, method as well, I think it is very important when DepEd makes presentations or when you are called to hearings, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives, that you mention this because. Uh, Senator Marcus is very aware of this because she's the one who raised this in the last hearing, which I, 
I, uh, I seconded, no? I supported her point of view on this. That kanya-kanyang lobby kasi ang mga ang mga legislators dun sa pinaniniwalaan nilang important subject matter, no? And lahat naman important, but at the end of the day, DepEd has that obligation to filter all of this and to decide how many hours of each do they get. And very seldom, no, it is often mentioned that I don't worry, ma'am, sir, naka-embed na ho yan dun sa isang um, sa subject natin na ganun. But most legislators do not have that concept of this integrative or cross-disciplinary approach because we were brought up, as you said, we are still teaching one subject. So pag sinabi nyo na, ay, inimbed na ho namin yung, uh, kunyari, uh, ano man topic yun, uh, whatever topic, na inbed na ho yan dun sa um, social studies and blah, blah, blah. Akala nila, you are diminishing the importance of that subject matter. So I'm just giving you a tip on how to present it so that there's a better understanding that you are doing this, but this is the method of how you teach that subject matter. Okay? Kasi year in and year out, yun yung narinig kong problema eh. And, and there is a lack of understanding that the approach is really meant to be integrative. Uh, may I respond, uh, Madam of Chair? Of course, sure. Yes. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, first, uh, what you mentioned about information literacy, uh, no no time uh, is is the importance of this uh, shown is than the time of COVID-19 where uh, uh, information, uh, whether supported or not by scientific evidence, are really uh, out there and can move uh, decisions, policies, opinions, uh, of people across all uh, facets of uh, life. And uh, in fact, in the PISA result, uh, Madam Chair, uh, that information literacy played a big role in uh, some uh, in our low performance in reading. So this is an area that we really need to uh, strengthen, especially with multiple uh, sources of, uh, of information. Uh, it is not enough that you uh, understand uh, the literal meaning of the word, but you have also have to deal with uh, sometimes conflicting opinions, conflicting evidence, and these are matters that need to be weighed uh, yes. by our learners, Madam Chair. With respect to the integration, uh, I think uh, this is a matter that uh, is a, a, a big challenge for the department because it involves not just a curriculum, but also the pedagogy and practice of our teachers in uh, teaching uh, the subject. Uh, in other words, there are instances when the curriculum comes ahead of uh, the ability of our, uh, of our learning situations to adapt to the curriculum. In terms of, uh, as I mentioned, pedagogy, our learning resources as well, as, and uh, the learning activities that are engaged in by the teachers and the uh, learners. And here, it is very important, Madam Chair, uh, per, especially for a futures thinking unit, to be able to demonstrate how this is really done. Uh, because usually, uh, the path to change uh, has to be shown uh, by concrete uh, demonstration. And I think we need to uh, be able to find uh, leading components similar to what, uh, for example, uh, the school in Taguig has done. In other words, uh, uh, being able to demonstrate that a, a, a graduation at this time can be done in a safe manner and in an innovative manner. Uh, there will always have to be that concretization so that the uh, curriculum adjustment is made real uh, at the classroom level, Madam Chair. Uh, okay. If I may proceed with the next uh, uh, with the next slide. Uh, um, before you proceed, no, let me just acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator Pacquiao. Um, Senator Mani, feel free if may questions ka, no, just um, uh, open your mic and feel free to ano. And Senator Aimee as well. Anyway, um, yes, um, Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Pacquiao. Yes. Uh, Thank Madam you. Uh, I just have. Um, After him, after him, after him. Yeah. May I proceed, Madam Chair? Yes. Before you proceed, one last comment lang. Uh, when we were talking about how to help these uh, students discern, you know, that's one lesson that um, if we can create a generation of, uh, um, how, how do I describe it? Um, not just intelligent, no, but discerning 
discerning young people who will take advantage of this time of COVID to learn to analyze information. Ang laking pagbabago ng generation. Kasi the generation we have now, share ng share ng kung ano-anong information, mali-mali, wala silang kapakipakialam na kung valid yung information na sinishare nila, gusto lang nilang maunang mag-share. If you can take advantage of this and teach these kids, all you have to do is click it, check check the topic, does it make sense, what is the source, do independent research. In 5 to 10 minutes, you have a valid, you might have an, uh, a decision if it's worth sharing, di ba? Mga li- maliliit na, na changes that we can already make will honestly, to me, alter the, the online presence of the Filipinos if these young people can be educated in that manner. So, yun lang interjection ko, very practical, dun sa sinasabi mo na agree na agree din ako. Including the uh, older generation, Madam Chair. Uh, Actually, on... lalo na yung older generation. <laughs> pero we are talking about basic education right now, so focus muna yeah, tayo yes, sa yes, 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 Madam Chair. Uh, the next slide, uh, slide 27, just uh, provides uh, a, a, a listing of uh, what may be uh, called uh, uh, durable skills uh, that workers need to thrive in rapidly evolving organizations. So I, I will not delve into that, but uh, they are uh, a, a that involves uh, in the areas of uh, of uh, uh, thinking skills, uh, interacting or uh, interpersonal skills, managing ourselves or interpersonal skills and leadership skills. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this has always uh, to go back to our idea of a flourishing individual. In other words, why we are doing this is uh, to have that uh, uh, a flourishing individual in terms of the agency, the skills for work, uh, and, and to be able to uh, to cope with the uh, rapid changes in both technology uh, and challenges of uh, of uh, the times uh, next slide uh, uh, the next slide uh, presents it's just a from the scoping study of dr. Monterola it just looks at uh, the need to anticipate educational opportunities arising from innovations uh in other words uh, the the uh the change so also uh, different opportunities and for us to be able to uh, uh position ourselves in our education system for our learners to be able to take advantage of those uh opportunities then we need to identify them uh, uh, what uh, the emerging opportunities are. And this is just some of the uh, listings, but they include identifying the relevant relevant knowledge, skills, and uh, uh, and mindsets in preparing our uh, learners to adapt uh, to different technologies and thereby being able to uh, take advantage of the opportunities. And uh, so these are just some of the uh, scoped uh, examples of uh, opportunities from innovations that are happening at as of this time i think this is uh, even more important to our, our uh, higher education institutions uh, or our colleges and universities but the preparation of the uh, ability to uh, identify what knowledge are needed and what mindsets are needed to adapt to this has to start at the level of uh, basic education uh next slide uh um, before oh, you go to the next slide no i yes, just want Chair. to comment that i'm very happy to see that i those are that that previous slide and if you can go back it's really what i've been wanting to see and that's why i'm happy that uh, the senate now has this committee because it gives you the time to make this kind of presentation to us it gives us an idea or some degree of um satisfaction na, meron pa lang nag-aabalang mag-aral ng ganito. So, um, maybe in a future hearing or, um, um, yeah, most likely in a future hearing, we can dissect this even further because I'd really like to know um, how far along are we in preparing our students for the jobs of the futures, no? And, you know, you can often read um, 
um, uh, articles that say that every every few years, and I have I have kids at that age, no college age, kaka graduate lang. Na ano yung mga courses na ano yung mga trabaho na ma eliminate na dapat very conscious tayo don, di ba? Kung kung ano yun dahil aral tayo ng aral ng ganyan, tapos wala na palang trabaho na ganon. And in the same way, ano din yung um, either because it's going to be mechanized. Or, or that we have other other countries who are competing with us and who are much, much more proficient at us kasi lamang naman lamang na rin sila doon. The last point I want to raise then about this is something that is um, a known advantage that we have, and that is the English language. No, um, I don't know if you're going to touch on that. That is not a technical skill per se, but it's a, um, it's a skill that the earlier generations were very good at, and as every year progresses, we become worse yes, at worse. it. So I wanted to check if this is something that you are also um, concerned about because it's an advantage that we have. It's the reason why we are the leaders in the BPO industry, no? among others. Yes, Senator Marcos, I noted you. I'll give you the floor in one second. So ah, I just thank wanted, you. Sorry. I just wanted the USEC to, um, to take note of that. Uh, you can, you can um, answer later on or, or in a future time. But I'd like to give the floor now to Senator Marcos. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you very much, Chair Pia. Um, I uh, was concerned about the previous slide, the one regarding sa human skills. You know, okay. sa flourishing individual with thinking, interacting, managing ourselves. Yung naon na puriyan. Pwede balikan uh, yon. Pwede balikan lang, kasi uh, sa experience po namin na uh, sa pagte train, for example, sa call center, at uh, sa pagte train sa iba't ibang trabaho, kasi mga ilong ano naga abroad na no, uh, lagi silang okay sa English, okay din sila sa computer skills, laging gumabagsak sa tinatawag na life skills, katulad na nakalista rito, yung simpleng-simpleng uh, resourcefulness, yung uh, determination, teamwork, leadership, yung life skills na tinatawag, paano ho ba talaga tinuturo yan? Because apparently, that's the area where we, as an educational system, are failing. We're not failing sa technical skills per se. Mas mabigat yung ating um, yung uh, output-oriented, results-oriented kulang, yung teamwork. Uh, may isa talagang Pilipino, aako na lang lahat ng trabaho, kulang sa leadership. All these things that are probably called the soft soft or the life skills. Paano ba tinuturo yan? Kasi magiging more important yan sa ating futures planning, futures thinking, ay yung resiliency, creativity, lahat yan magiging part ng... Uh, ma Madam Chair, may... Uh, Please, I also uh, want to hear that. Thank you for having me. Very interesting. Madam Chair, the, the, the Chair with respect to the uh, to uh, some of the uh, future opportunities, and I think this is Tesla because Tesla is uh, working uh, training of uh, technical uh, is fast change. We be able to think ahead uh, as well of uh, or on the remarks of the uh, of uh, center, the honorable center Mark. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, is always with between uh, being able to uh, where the, the curriculum has already adjusted, but the manner of uh, of teaching this at the classroom level is what may be lagging uh, behind. Uh, and it, again, it it requires a a kind of uh, a teacher. That's why in Sulong Edukalidad, Madam Chair, uh, the second pillar of that. Is the uh, uh, upskilling and reskilling of teachers because this requires a, a shift in the uh, way that uh, teachers are uh, able to uh, harness learning resources and learning activities for students. It cannot be the usual uh, uh, students seated uh, on their on their desks. Uh, by their lonesome, and that's why even the desks now, Madam Chair, has been uh, is being changed from the individual yeah. uh, armchair to a table, uh, and this is to allow uh, opportunities for more interactive uh, uh, learning uh, activities for the for the students. But it requires uh, 
a change also in the learning resources and as I mentioned, an upskilling and reskilling of teachers. Uh, the uh, idea of... Uh, uh, the, with, all due respect, yes. with all due respect, ang sabi po kasi ng ibang uh, education uh, specialists sa uh, UNESCO, alimbawa, kailangan ka mag sa teacher kasi parang profound yung lack of confidence and self-esteem. Medyo kulang na kulang sa ambisyon ang Pilipino. Parang okay lang hanggang dito lang ako. So perhaps uh, mag-uumpisa yan sa mga teacher natin, yung resourcefulness, yung confidence, leadership, uh, yun nga, yung collaborative framework, pagkatapos syempre yung ating resiliency finally. Uh, yes, teacher talaga, uh, pati crisis management, teacher pa rin eh. Uh, but at, at the same time, we do note, uh, Madam Chair, that the that the source of the resiliency of the department it, it's 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 too too prong. Uh, the the source of the resiliency of the department also uh, lies in our teachers historically, and uh, we believe that uh, with the proper uh, inspiration, uh, support, and a a a, a path. Uh, that is uh, provided to them, like uh, our school in uh, in Taguig, as has, uh, as has been demonstrated. Uh, they are our schools will be the seats of innovation. But what we need are demonstration uh, 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 pilots, uh, and that is something that the a unit like Futures Thinking Unit can uh, work on because uh, most of the bureaucracy is sometimes saddled with. Uh, having to catch up with the past and uh, we need a, a unit also that uh, uh, is a has greater flexibility and agility to think uh, uh, about the future and act on it and put some demonstration to, to lead the way that the department has a capacity to adapt uh, if they can be shown a, a, a good working concrete uh, example and we, we believe that, uh, in fact, this COVID situation, and I shared the uh, the comment also of uh, the chairman uh, that became probably con controversial, but uh, the the idea of uh, uh, of the constraints uh, uh, triggering uh, opportunities for innovation and adaptation is really very real. So yes, uh, Madam. Chair, the, the challenge is uh, is big. Uh, the Honorable uh, Senator Marcos, uh, but uh, precisely we need uh, a unit that will be able to provide a concrete demonstration of how to move forward. And we are confident in the ability of the field uh, of our schools to adapt. I, I think uh, in Ilocos, uh, you have a, a schools that are very innovative also. Yeah. Uh, in, I know that uh, the, yes, the good senator say, um, is uh, Ilocanos in put, uh, IT. Great, yes, Ilocanos put great store by education and uh, talagang empathetic sila dyan. Kaya nga lang, ang problema, nakikita natin yung mga, yung mga life skills na tinatawag para nakakalimutan natin kung minsan kasi hindi natuturo sa bahay, hindi rin natuturo sa eskwelahan. Ang realidad, yung uh, karamihan na pumapasok sa education, sabihin na natin totoo, pinakamura kasing degree yan. Usually, hindi naman yan ang first choice ng bata eh, ng estudyante. Unfortunately, ang hirap magkarap ng truly committed na teacher sa panahong ito. Salamat. Thank you. Uh, thank you thank you very much also uh ma ma madam chair and uh, i think that that is where uh, uh the committee such as this that uh, looks at how to uh, translate uh visioning for the future into uh, the present reality is a, a very important if i may i i madam chair i think i only have uh two more slides uh or three slides uh the uh, slide 29 uh, just looks into what are the support uh, mechanisms that will enable uh, enable that and uh, such innovation in 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 uh, classroom instruction uh, and uh, we need to have a progressive form uh, previous slide please uh, uh, we need more progressive forms of assessments, uh, Madam Chair. It's not anymore uh, the the literacies that uh, Senator Marcos, for example, was mentioning the soft skills. 
many of these cannot be measured anymore with the usual traditional pencil and paper uh, exam. These are more demonstrated in how they uh, do problem solving as a, as a group, for example, uh, or as a team. Uh, and so this will require uh, new tools of uh, assessment uh, to be uh, explored, uh, venturing, and, and we should also go into uh, the way to incentivize this, and uh, this, this uh, links to the Philippine Qualifications Framework, is to be able to recognize uh, and quality assure uh, some of these skills also uh, through uh, micro-credentialing and uh, ladderized uh, uh, approaches so that we, we, we are able to take advantage of it, not just in the context of formal education, but also in uh, other areas of work. Madam Chair, uh, those soft skills that the Senator uh, has mentioned, are, are many of them are uh, in in various uh, circumstances can be learned, whether it is in sports, for example, uh, whether it is in a civic community activity, uh, most of those uh, are not necessarily in the in inside a classroom setting that uh, can be learned. Uh, the other one is the potential for using uh, artificial in intelligence in assessing uh, student readiness achievement literacy level, career track, uh, work readiness, and so on. Uh, and this is to assist our teachers. In other words, the assessment of our students need not be performed by a teacher alone, but there are certain activities uh, where artificial intelligence can be employed uh, to be able to track uh, the development of, uh, of a learner, sometimes much more than uh, a teacher would be able to do. Although, of course, the, uh, the, the assessments by a teacher will still be indispensable. Uh, uh, next slide, on slide 30. Uh, this is to be, and again, uh, the present COVID situation uh, puts this into uh, a compelling need at the moment. Uh, uh, the alternative learning spaces. The learning spaces now are not only confined to physical and formal learning spaces, and that will be shown much, much more with the need for distance learning, uh, Madam Chair. So it can be also in virtual learning spaces uh, and also in informal uh, settings, uh, especially if we are restricted from the students coming to the school on account of COVID-19, for example. How do we uh, reimagine the uh, learning space outside of a classroom. And I think it's very clear now because I think the the country as a whole cannot imagine a learning without the students physically reporting to school. But uh, the Taguig uh, experience with the graduation shows that a graduation ceremony can be conducted with the presence of all but virtually. Uh, uh, and finally, our last slide, Madam Chair, uh, in the scoping work of uh, Dr. Monterola, she has uh, uh, provided to uh, an immediate a distinction between an immediate future, those that are uh, something that we need to catch up, but is already here. Uh, in other words, it is already for many countries already yesterday, but. Uh, but uh, for us, it is still catching up on an immediate future. But we need to imagine more than the immediate future, but the near future. And uh, uh, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, there is a scoping study that is still ongoing uh, by the Education Futures Unit of the department. Uh, the COVID-19 did not stop the unit from uh, already uh, doing its work. And towards the fourth quarter of this year, we will organize a visioning forum or conference to further enrich the areas uh, that we intend to work on and to discover partners to build our futures thinking constellations. The, the matter, Madam Chair, of having a futures thinking unit is that we cannot rely on existing uh, human resource because uh, you might have a unit that is 
uh, peopled by backward thinking people. So it's it's difficult to have that. We need to find uh, various uh, uh, units that are bearers of uh, futures thinking, and it can only be done through uh, networking and uh, partnership. So. Uh, in conclusion, Madam Chair, we look forward to continued partnerships with the committee on this endeavor. We, we, I'm sure that we will be uh, seeking the support and uh, participation of the committee uh, when we do our visioning forum uh, towards the fourth quarter of this year, Madam Chair. I, uh, this, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Yusef. Yes, uh, Senator Pacquiao, uh, you'd like to say something? Go ahead. Yes, before I ask, uh, I start asking questions, uh, I would like to uh, uh, see uh, my opening statement. Madam Chair, I would like to commend you for uh, your efforts in bringing together experts in, in innovation and futures thinking as we look into our sustainable development goals. We uh, Let me thank uh, all our resource persons for their uh, precious time and efforts in helping us look beyond this pandemic and for helping us prepare for the new normal. My prayer is that uh, with the abundance of natural resources in our country and with all the creative minds of our people. <clears throat> we will not remain as a third world country as uh, that is begging for help and sitting for what is less. I declare that as we pull our all effort together and use all the blessings that God has given us as Filipinos, we'll be able to turn all these uh, challenges and opportunities. I declare that with with our God-given abilities and talents, we would be able to uh, learn our lessons uh, well. Uh, we would be able to overcome this pandemic, and uh, we would be able to rise above our circumstances. We will use our uh, our Filipino values to our advantage, and we will be a blessing to the world. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Pacquiao. Senator Pacquiao is one of my idols because uh, uh, continued and is continuing educating himself as I think we all should do. Education is a lifelong process. So, sana lalong uh, tularan ka ng mga estudyante natin, Senator Pacquiao. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd, I'd like to call on and our next speaker would be Tessa, Marisa Legaski. Um, and then after that would be Pasok. But I'd like to... Um, inform the other resource persons here because we have session at three o'clock and we start promptly at three o'clock there's a big chance that we will not finish everyone so if there are any of you who have other appointments i really don't yeah. mind if you have to go it's understandable dahil i already foresaw be a lot of questions and i do not want to prevent my colleagues and even myself from asking questions kung maganda yung mga statements no so kung may mga we have those coming from the private sector. Kung may mga appointment po kayo, naintindihan ko yan. Um, but please message us so that we can um, schedule you again. I will I will definitely have a part two. But if you can stay on, gusto ko rin, kasi I would also like to get your comments and feedbacks about the presentations. So, yun lang, para hindi naman kayo maaberya kung may mga kailangan din kayong gawin at nagantay kayo na matapos itong hearing, tas baka hindi ko kayo matawag. <laughs> So may I get Tesla and following Tesla is uh, Pasuk, si Dr. Uh, Tirso Ronquillo. Please go ahead, Tesla. Ms. Marisa Legaspi. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator, and magandang hapon po to the chair and to the members of the committee as well as the other participants in this online hearing. So on behalf of uh, Secretary Isidro S. La Peña, let me share with you what we are towards the new normal. Uh, first, first, we have already our uh. it's cutting off. Even beyond the pandemic, and that, that's the part. Yes. Garbo. Garbo, you but, know. Huh? 
hindi namin kayo ma- wala kaming maintindihan. There's too early cutting off. Uh, yeah. If your signal is erratic now, why don't I call somebody else? And then uh, let's see if your signal improves in a while because we cannot hear anything. Let's proceed first in the interest of time. No, let's proceed with Pasok, um, si um, President uh, Tirso Rompillo, and then we will call on Ms. Legaspi later on. Wala, walang sound? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, hello. Uh, okay, yes. President Rompillo, please proceed. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Pia. First, I would like to thank you for inviting Pasok in this uh, short conversation about innovation and future thinking. Uh, as you may know already that uh, SUCs, we have 112 in our networks and we all now uh, ask budget from the government so that we can pursue our innovation. First, we would like to thank you for your efforts in bringing, up the, bring, bringing back the budget of the SUCs during the last that you really help us fight for or appeal for the government in bringing back our funds for specifically for ICT infrastructure because we know that in higher education, uh, innovation will really start from research. And uh, we can do further on research if we are supported with this infrastructure. As we now migrate to new normal, still we need infrastructure when it comes to softwares and other uh, uh, high-end uh, research uh, materials that we will be needing. There is also a need for business and politics. So we have launched our what we call the PC program, PISI, Platform for Innovating SUCs for Industry 4.0. Now, uh, in that uh, platform, we have four strands. That is, uh, innovation diagnostic is the first strand where we need to diagnose really all our innovation capitals in our state university. When we say innovation capital, these are the faculty, even students, even administrators, because admittedly, SUCs or state universities are at a different level of development. There is a need for us to have a self-diagnosis. In what areas do we really need some improvement on when it comes to the number of PhDs in our SUCs per discipline? The number of researchers in specific areas, because you know, SUCs, or as you may know, SUCs are located in different regions. Our goal is really to participate in regional development. So in our assessment, SUCs really uh, need a push or a boost on our human resources development so that we can participate actively in the development in the region. There are regions that, uh, that need support really on food, uh, uh, food security, even on uh, technology, let's say on disaster management, because many of our provinces or even regions are now suffering from different types of calamities now even our SUCs are actively participating but still we in our assessment in our diagnostic tool that PASOK uh, work with STRIDE, USAID STRIDE. USAID STRIDE is helping PASOK in coming up with this uh, innovation diagnostic tool and uh, that tool really as we share Mr. Senator will be giving you a copy of our uh, diagnostic tool. Uh, this really look into the readiness of our SUCs in terms of infrastructure, in terms of human resource, in terms of programs even. Though we have uh, forwarded a lot of innovation programs, as we introduce in our uh, uh, curricula, the process on entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, we believe that the research outputs of our universities must really be uh, adapted in the market. May it be IT, may it be electronics, may it be medicine. We really believe that this should really uh, support or this should really uh, uh, answer the problems of the communities. So that's why 
we now introduce entrepreneurship in our course. This is in compliance with the demands even of the uh, international trading body that innovation really will be called innovation if it really supports or if it really answers problems of the communities or even problems of the industries or even needs of the market. That is our views on innovation. So, Madam Chair, uh, it has to be inclusive also. That is in uh, result of our diagnostics that innovation must have to be inclusive. So it, it must be participative. That even uh, SUCs must uh, participate with the, uh, collaborate with the industry and even with the government and even with the private sector. We believe in the inclusiveness approach in innovation. That innovation must be a system. We cannot work in silos because the problems that we are solving is really a systems problem. Seldom that we can find uh, because usually the problems that we solve in our subject in the school is a, a it's a simple project but when you go outside the university the problems that we will be solving is a system problem that's why we believe in the inclusiveness approach in innovation and uh, in our state universities and colleges we also partner with some uh, funding institutions whether it is government or whether it is private PASOK is now uh, partnering with our uh, uh, support universities in uh, Singapore, the Singapore Polytechnic, and even other universities in Taiwan. Just really to inspire innovation among state universities and colleges. Singapore Polytechnic, in partnership with uh, Temasek Foundation, is funding state universities' uh, capital development program, the innovation capital development program. Uh, a number of our SUCs were trained and these uh, trained universities are considered master trainers, which are expected to train further other SUCs. That is the framework of our program with Singapore Polytechnic. And uh, this is, I think, our second wave of our uh, program. The first uh, is on CDIO, Concept, Design, Implement, and Operate, that is on technology and engineering which lasted last 2019 we are about to start this new program on the second uh second season of the program that is on innovation capital development but however because of this pandemic it was postponed and we are positive that come september we can receive funding from temasek foundation these are now some programs that we are working with uh, other partner agencies Stride, for example, you said Stride is supporting a lot of our innovation programs in our state university colleges. They have programs with uh, with uh, uh, which focus on uh, some professional science masters in different areas. So some of our universities benefited from this program of uh, USAID Stride and many others. Now our approach now in uh, SUCs is on uh, inclusive collaboration. We are now pairing our state universities who are good in IT and engineering to solve problems in agriculture even. So that's now our approach. So we now cluster our universities based on our uh, expertise or needs area to solve problems of the communities or even problems in the region. So Madam Chair, these are just some updates on what we are doing in our state universities and colleges. But of course, we admittedly, we are now uh, facing challenge when it comes to further runs of our innovation activities because of this uh, uh, impending cut in our uh, infrastructure uh, development uh, budget. So again, I would like to uh, ask the support of our uh, senators, of course, Senator Pia and other senators that we have in this forum. Thank you for your support to state universities and colleges. As presented by Senator Villanueva during the hearing, we have around 17.93 billion, which are uh, uh, about to be cut. But uh, as, you may, uh, as you may know, we have 112. And this is still distributed among SUCs. So still that is very, very, uh, should I say, minimal. And we can expect that this uh, budget will really spur innovation. How much more if we will be cutting them? So that's our appeal to our senators. And again, uh, we will submit our office, uh, Madam Chair, uh, updates on the innovation programs that we're having in our state universities and colleges. Thank you, Madam Chair.
thank you. Um, may I request that you, I'm not sure if you submitted the position paper, no, but I'd like to come up with a report that highlights uh, a few of the innovations that you mentioned on the training that your SUCs are receiving with partners, such as uh, partners from um, uh, the Polytechnic, um, Singapore Polytechnic, Polytechnic that you mentioned. No? So, paki-summarize yan sa, para sa amin, para masama natin yan sa report natin, ha? That's yes, very good. Rest assured of our continued support for uh, your budget. No, I, I really, you, you already know how how strongly I feel about that. So, um, next next uh, speaker will be um, from DICT, Mr. Luigi De Vera. Um, nas sa chat box may nakita ako na may nagtatanong na ano ba daw ang status nitong connectivity natin. So, ito na, ito na yung sagot na inaantay natin. Please proceed, Mr. Luigi De Vera. Good afternoon, Senator P, and good afternoon to everyone in the hearing. Um, right now, ma'am, we are ramping up the connection for the free Wi-Fi program of the ICT. We have recently asked Manika Intik of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Digital Philippines is proposing for um, connectivity of at least 50% of all public um, schools in the Philippines. And um, we are piloting a digital education program in San Juan City. So we can test whether or not the connectivity and the uh, resources available with DepEd right now will be delivered to the students before the opening of the classes. So the target for this, ma'am, is that we will provide laptops and connectivity to students and teachers and provide a learning management system where they can upload their content and students can submit their assignments and um, activities in classes. We are also developing a digital education program which will target the training of teachers for public school teachers to adapt to the new normal so they can learn how to use, make use of ICT tools. And uh, just today we've been, I've personally um, got in touch with DepEd so we can work together because I've seen from the presentation of um, USEC NEPO that they're, they're also working towards providing equipment and connectivity to students. Um, that's also the target for this year, ma'am. However, um, of course, uh, the budget of the DICT is very limited at the moment, and we are trying our best to reallocate the funds of the department to make sure that we address all of the concerns for net internet connectivity in the, in the country. In the position paper that we have submitted, some of the initiatives that we're already doing right now is the Digital Education and the ICTA Academy. Although I think for this hearing, the ICT Academy is not the focus because it will be for young professionals who will need uh, reskilling and who will need um, upskilling as well. Is that all? Y that's that's it for the meeting, ma'am. Okay, thank you. No, that was very concise. Um, I appreciate that. Um, very quick questions. No, when you say that you are now trying to um set up the connectivity for fifty percent of public schools, did I hear you right? Uh, that's our proposal, ma'am. Um, we're waiting oh, for. That's a proposal. Okay. Yes. And what's the budget for that? Do you have a an as uh estimate? Um, uh, ma'am, I don't have the estimate right now with me. But I will can send you it to your it, office. Can you give it to us? Because yes, um, we are, we, I, I meet with the economic team regularly. And if there's a way that you can send that to me before 4 o'clock, um, I, I will push for that. Okay? I'll, I'll make a way, ma'am. I'll send it to you immediately. Yes, anyway, some, ano lang naman, eh, estimate, no? So yes, some, this is a figure that we can work with. And then, yes, um, yeah, I, I, well, you already mentioned it, that you will work with DepEd. But I kind of assume that you already are. So maybe you can fast track that, no? Uh, you said, um you uh, said uh, NAP is there and could you coordinate because medyo, medyo sayang naman yung effort if you're not, no? because I, I can't imagine that you would be um, piloting digital, digital education for teach, teachers without, without, without working with them. No, that, that I has actually, we, are already, we are already working with DepEd, but not with um, USIC NEPO's office, but I think with the futures unit of DepEd, ah, okay. we well, synchronize okay. our efforts better. Okay. I think they work together naman. So kind of okay. keep us posted also, no? Because um, come, um, well, probably as early as July, the House will start hearing budgets for 2021. But I chaired the committee 
uh, I, I chair the the um, I'm the vice chair for the committee of, of uh, finance, and I oversee the budget of education. So I, that's why I, I'm very interested in those budgets that you are talking about. Um, and we will send you the estimates today. Yes, and then when you mentioned piloting in San Juan, but that's just one, no? So can you can you? I, I was asking my staff about the position paper, or they haven't received anything, no? So pa double check then. Um, I'll take a look at it, and then we can discuss separately in the interest of uh, getting uh, allowing more people to speak today. Thank you very much. I appreciate your concise but um, very specific uh, uh, statements on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, may I call on DAP, um, DAP, and uh, our, our. I'm not sure is it Dr. Lizan who is um, presenting, Dr. Alex, um, Professor. Uh, Flores, I'm not sure who of you are presenting. We've had our own, um, they were part of our earlier hearing on futures thinking. So may I ask that you just keep it brief, very specific to education. We will have a part two. You will be invited all the time. So um, what I'd really like to do is just for them to know that you are our partners in uh, the future of education. Uh, any thoughts that you have? And then I'd really like to start calling on the others because I have only 45 minutes to call on about 15 more speakers. Okay, please proceed. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Lizanne, uh, the Dean and uh, the Dean of the Graduate School. And uh, this afternoon, um, we would like to uh, share with you our uh, future thinking response you know, to a more uh, responsive education sector in COVID-19 Philippines. And uh, as a response to Senator Pia Cayetan's Senate Resolution Number 413 dated May 21, especially in this paragraph, um, which is shown on your screen, where in future thinking is really the anchor for us to have a systematic assessment of the education system and likewise for us to move towards an effective delivery of education system. So uh, this afternoon, we would like to share with you a framework on green education, which I will explain later on. But this framework is anchored on our strategic foresight, a framework that we shared uh, before with you last uh, committee hearing on SDGs. But the emphasis of this framework is really the, the use of policy tools and collaboration of stakeholders towards a sound and relevant uh, policy direction. In short, the framework informs us the imperative of the use of the right method for the right problem. But of course, at the end of the day, leadership is key in this framework because as what mentioned by uh, Senator Marcus earlier, we need more leadership and the soft skills, no? uh, like teamwork, for example. So with that, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Alex and Prof. Del Flores, will focus on the structural aspects of education as well as the teaching of SDGs in our curriculum. Prof. Del Flores will elaborate on why there is a need for future thinking in education in the Philippines. Prof. Del? Uh, thank you, Dean Lisan. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, honorable members of the committee. The COVID-19 pandemic brought about dramatic changes in the world and society such that we can say that the future is no longer what it used to be. What used to be the expectations, dreams, and aspirations of our youth may no longer be feasible in a post-COVID-19 world. For instance, career opportunities in aviation, tourism, entertainment, leisure, and even professional sports may become more limited. On the other hand, we can also say that COVID-19 only accelerated the trends that were already developing even before the pandemic, like work from home arrangements and the growing importance of information and communication technology, or ICT, and artificial intelligence, or AI, in our daily lives. The fourth industrial revolution centered on the fusion between and among physical reality, digital technology, and biotechnology seems to be coming in full force sooner rather than later. Uh, for example, we have the cyber graduation that uh, had been presented earlier. It is uh, one uh, manifestation of this uh, fusion between uh, by, uh, uh, digital technology and uh, physical uh, reality. In this case, we can actually say that the future has come too early. Whatever the situation is, uh, we believe that COVID-19 highlighted the need for more urgent educational reforms in our country. For instance, our labor force should be equipped uh, to be more relevant and competitive in the post-COVID-19 economy. 
Our citizens should also be informed better on the social, economic, political, and ethical implications of the COVID, uh, post-COVID-19 world. The current pandemic seems to have magnified issues on access to social services, including health and education, as well as on social justice and cyber citizenship, among many other concerns. We believe that futures thinking is essential in responding effectively to these opportunities and, uh, challenge, uh, and challenges as it allows us to plan 10, 20, or 30 years ahead without actually discounting uh, present uh, concerns. In fact, uh, futures thinking gives us an opportunity to revisit various education sector assessments and build upon them. For instance, our group led by Dr. Alex uh, Brillantes uh, with uh, Dean Liz and Kalina was previously commissioned by the Department of Budget and Management to conduct a governance review of the education sector in relation to possible government exercising program. Among the documents uh, we studied were the results of the Congressional Commission uh, on Education or EDCOM report uh, of 1991 and the Presidential Commission on Educational Reform or PISER report of uh, 2000. We are also privileged, as uh, Yusek uh, Depo mentioned earlier, to be involved in the proposed uh, future speaking efforts of the Department of uh, Education through the initiative of uh, our beloved uh, colleague in UPNC PAG, Secretary Miling Briones, and the Secretary Maluluan, and uh, Director uh, Demetria uh, Manuel. Going back to the opportunities and uh, challenges uh, brought about by COVID-19 to our education sector, we believe that the pandemic has emphasized the importance of access to distance education and uh, online learning. Schools offering distance education and online courses are actually the least affected uh, by the pandemic in our education sector. In fact, uh, we can even say that uh, these, uh, online uh, these schools offering online courses are now uh, thriving. However, this has also brought up, up the issue of what we call the digital divide. As we found out that many of our students, uh, even in the top universities, and even some of the professors do not have access to a secure internet connection as well as learning equipment like laptops or tablets. The schools themselves might need to invest more on digital technologies apart from strengthening their curricula and coming up with courses that are more in tune with the new normal. For example, I remember the experience of South Korea before when they had this big push on computerization. They made sure that every household in Korea and uh, have a personal computer and uh, the household members are knowledgeable on uh, what are the uses of these uh, personal computers. There might also be a need to retool our teachers or even our parents uh, before classes resume in employing a blend of face-to-face -face and distance learning. The challenges in uh, pedagogy and uh, learning delivery brought about by online classes and homeschooling must be surmounted to ensure quality of uh, education. If there is anything positive that we can get from this situation, it is the opportunity for our students and education system to hasten the integration of 21st century skills, mainly identified with what uh, Dr. Domingo uh, mentioned uh, last, uh, during the last hearing, uh, the forces of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. We believe that students who are already utilizing digital technologies in learning will be in a better position to understand their principles and appreciate the myriad possibilities that they can actually offer. The COVID-19 pandemic has also underscored the importance of science and technology in various aspects of life, like medicine, biotechnology, and computing. This gives us an opportunity to place more focus on these fields and inspire our pupils and students to pursue careers in these uh, disciplines. As we grapple with the pandemic, deep-seated issues in our education sector remain. For instance, the trifocalization of education could have allowed for more specialization among education sector agencies and sharper focus on specific issues, but also diminish the coordination among DepEd, CHED, and uh, TESDA. With the need for 21st century skills to be integrated seamlessly at all levels of education, as well as the need to optimize scarce financial resources in investing on digital technologies, there might be a need once again for coordination or more coordination among the three education agencies, together with the uh, DOST and uh, also the PRC. The newly established uh, PQF or the Philippine Qualifications Framework can be an excellent venue for this uh, coordination. 
As a big part of our labor force is employed in services and the informal sector, which proved to be vulnerable in situations like the current pandemic, there is a need to further lessen inequities in access to education, especially at the secondary or high school level. The benefits of the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education Act could further be maximized if a larger percentage of our students could finish high school and progress towards higher and vocational education. Also, with the opportunities presented by online and distance learning, which seems to be thriving, there is a need to accelerate the implementation of the Philippine Qualifications Framework, or PQF, for the benefit of those who are taking these uh, courses so that they can be uh, accredited and recognized by their potential employers, and also for those who are employed uh, by this subsector. We believe that it can become even more competitive if uh, the PQF uh, framework uh, would be uh, implemented uh, 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 widely. At this point, uh, Dr. Alex Pilates will be discussing the importance of making our educational institutions more competitive at the regional and uh, global levels. Sir Alex. Sir Alex, please turn on your microphone. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, if there's any message, Madam Chair, that you mentioned, we're talking about the future, just two very important things. We're talking futures thinking and how we should respond to two very important things, globalization and cooperation. Globalization, thinking global, yet acting local, and cooperating and yet competing. At the end of the day, when we talk about the future, even in these days of the pandemic, it's important to cooperate, yet also compete. And it's all important to think global, yet act local. That's the next slide. I'll, Let's talk about the next slide, Celine, please. Okay. Where, where, where does the Philippines stand as far as this concerned? Even when I was with Chad, and I know Madam Chair was the, uh, we, we sat on several boards. It's very, very important that our schools, I know uh, uh, Dr. Tears was also listening. I know that a very, very important component of education in, in, in particular, a higher education and higher education in particular is really the whole notion of how does the Philippines fare vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. We might be good, but we are not good enough. I think that's very, very important. <clears throat> what? We have been ranked by others uh, globally in terms of the image of our institution, in terms of internationalization, in terms of student enrollment, in terms of research connections, in terms of partnerships, and even be, uh, the best scholars. We may be okay, but we could be better. If we're talking about the future, if we're talking about being more global, if we're talking about more, uh, being more competitive. Next slide. Uh, two very important, uh, next slide, Celine, please. Two very important uh, institutions that have been doing this are the QS and World Rankings uh, that have somehow uh, ranked all the higher education institutions in the world today. And just to disturb us, I think it's important. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, Celine, please. Uh, if you look at this, QS, top uh, world, world, Southeast Asian best universities. Southeast Asia lang po ito. Ang Philippines, which is supposed to be the number one university po, is number 14 in Southeast Asia. Next slide. If you look at the, uh, next slide, please. If you look at the uh, Times uh, Higher Education, only two universities were in the top 20 in Southeast Asia. I guess I mentioned in this po, uh, for, uh, in order to sum up, as pointed by, by uh, Senator Marcos earlier, critical thinking even among ourselves when we see these things. If you look at this, UP is number four, and La Salle is number 16. Where are the rest? This is in Southeast Asia. Next slide. I will hurry with this, just to suggest uh, my point. If you look at this ranking of universities in Asia, the first was in Southeast Asia. Now in, in Southeast Asia, next is in Asia. UP, uh, uh, Ateneo, La Salle, and, uh, uh, and uh, UST uh, are 72, 115. 155 and 162 respectively. In other words, we could be better. As I showed in the next in the previous slides, sometimes we are now we are we fall behind universities in Thailand, Indonesia, and of course Malaysia and of course Singapore. Next slide. Now, if you look at the world, I think the next slide talks about rankings. Slide uh Celine, next slide, please. Uh, uh, the next slide would, would suggest I, I think we should move to the next slide, Celine. Um uh, the, well, the slide before that really talked about how we rank vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, but I just I guess I just missed that. 
and the picture isn't really as pretty. The point, dear friends, and as, point, as uh, pointed by, by Senator Cayetano in the beginning, if we're looking into the future, no, uh, we have to look at the how are how do we further globalize higher education by incorporating the teaching of SDGs. Point here is that I think in the future, apart from us being more competitive, we should also be involved in the global agenda, which is, among others, the teaching of SDGs in the curricula of universities. In, in one sense, Paul, we are, we're involved, as I think I mentioned in the previous uh, uh, hearing, that uh, how do we incorporate the teaching of SDGs in the curricul curriculum of our schools? This is an initiative of UNDESA and UNPOG, and even recently with the UN Committee of Experts in Public Administration. Next slide. Uh, Celine? Okay. So my point, dear friends, uh, uh, the, the slides didn't come very well, but my point is that first part, we need to be more competitive. We're talking about the future. We need to be more globally, globally oriented. And where we are now, we're not exactly there. Number two, it's very, very important that to be more global, we have to incorporate, among other things, our vision of 2030, which is, of course, the SDG. How do we incorporate the teaching of SDGs into our curriculum? There are some schools that do that, and we're not even in, in, in that aspect. Okay. So this slide, I think, is very, very important. And I think this was mentioned by Senator Pia, and of course, I think even Senator Mani and of course, Senator Marcos talk about, you know, when we're, and even uh, out here so earlier, it's really within the context of changing our mindsets. We can change structures till we are blue in the face. But if we don't change our mindsets, which is below the, the uh, iceberg, the public uh, mindset is very, very important. And that is what teaching, that is what education is all about. As, next slide. As pointed out by Dell earlier, we, can, we have many structural changes. Next slide, please. We have many structural changes earlier. No? Uh, we talked about the importance of uh, the trifocalization. Question, how far have we gone as far as that's concerned? We talk about amalgamation. Dr. Tirso talked about it. These are structural changes that I think we should look at in the future. But equally important, how do we change the mindsets of our teachers? And equally important, how do we develop international mindsets? We have programs such as EU Share, Erasmus. How do we bring in foreign faculty? Sometimes the problem is we have a difficult time uh, bringing in foreign, for, foreign faculty. I think it's very, very important. And the other, slide, the other points will just, just suggest the, the, the uh, infrastructure as pointed by, by Dell in terms of internet co connectivity, et cetera. The whole idea, Paul, is we can do structural changes, but equally important, we also have to do change our mindsets. And very important, as you pointed out, ma'am, earlier, the, con connect the linkage between and among like DepEd and, and, uh, and CHED and DOST, which sometimes have to be further, uh, have to work closer together, as brought out by finding of the EDCOM study, as brought out by the PCR study, and also as brought out by our right sizing study. Uh, next slide. I think I, that, that, that's where I end uh, in terms of this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lisan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alex. So taking off from your presentations and that of, doc, of Prof. Del Flores on the assessment of education, we find it appropriate that uh, we need to develop strategic foresight responses to promote sustainable future through developing new competencies in teaching, second, establishing international collaboration, and third, facilitating green technology and innovation. So the green education system framework as shown on your slide or on your screen is anchored on intergenerational responsibility doctrine, wherein the right of the future generations must be protected by the present generation. And this is the ethical component of futures thinking. And in fact, this concept was also reiterated in the Philippine case titled uh, Oposa versus Factorian, which can be considered as our own narrative. So again, the green education system is a response to Senator Pia Cayetan's Senate Resolution Number 413 and also to the call for action on the realization of sustainable development goals within the context of fourth industrial revolution era. So as shown again no, on your slide there, the green education system uh, will help us achieve several SDG goals from ending poverty to protecting humanity to protecting the environment, to creation of green jobs, which we have right now, uh, green economy, and green environment. 
And this is really part of DAP Graduate School's Continuing Education Program titled Futures Green Education in Public Service Using Case Studies and um, Policy Simulation Methodologies. Now, in fact, we are developing now a module with our Futures Thinking Academic Team and with the help of the Philippine Futures Thinking Society. Now, so we have that uh, in the Philippines right now. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, I think we have to, to end here uh, with green uh, education as, uh, as a framework for us to achieve SDG, to realize, and to have a futures thinking in the education sector. Muli maraming salamat po, Senator Pia Cayetano. Thank you sa team ng DAP. Thank you. Um, let me now call on, try ulit natin kung okay yung uh, connection ng TESDA, si uh, Ms. Marisa Tegas. Oh, thank you, ma'am. And my coming clear na? Mas malinaw yes. na po ba? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. So my colleague will share the presentation, but on behalf of Secretary La Peña, I'd like to share with you what we are doing now for the future of Tibet, especially under the new normal. But to immediately respond, of course, to the pandemic crisis, TESDA has formulated the TESDA operations plan, which should ensure our continuous provision of services and learning activities. So we have divided this into three phases. One is the survival, then the transitional, and the st structural. And this will give us opportunity also to devise innovative and more flexible uh, policies and uh, regulatory uh, arrangements, including the adoption of uh, flexible learning systems that should equip our workers with the necessary skills, even this time of pandemic. So we have laid out uh, all the uh, plans and activities, and these are contained in this plan. So moving forward to our uh, other initiatives, uh, actually the uh, TESDA is guided by the National Technical Education and Skills Development Plan. This is our roadmap for the TVET and our current plan is the uh, 2018 to 2022 and we understand of course that this will have to be recasted and to align this with the, uh, with the developments given the impact of the pandemic. So the, our plan, uh, the NTSDP we believe still consistent with the direction of the Philippine Development Plan and even our two-pronged direction of Tibet for global competitiveness and workforce readiness and Tibet for social equity uh, will still be applicable even in this time of pandemic. This plan uh, defines uh, all the policies and strategies that we will be implementing and uh, we are currently reviewing all these strategies to ensure that this will be responsive to the new normal uh, that are that is facing us we would like to inform also the body that uh, even before the pandemic and to prepare our work workforce to be 4.0 ready as well as to uh, in general to make them future ready our workforce we have already developed our four point uh tibet 4.0 framework and we are guided of course by the various uh uh, literature, even studies uh, on how to prepare our workforce. And foremost of this is the development of our learners to be 4.0 equipped. And uh, uh, because Tibet is uh, normally known to be more focused on technical skills, we are now expanding the coverage and giving more focus even for non-technical skills and to include uh, embed uh, more prominently in our uh, standards and uh, training regulations would be the STEM-related skills, uh, essential skills, and the socio-emotional skills. The essential uh, skills would uh, encompass even the 21st century skills, and I think this is also the, the skills that are uh, lacking, and this is being conveyed uh, by most of the employers. So our 4.0 framework uh, already defines uh, the different elements that will help us uh, craft the different uh, policies and strategies. And this will include how even our, uh, the development of our standards and curriculum, how we will align to international standards, how we will identify the present and future skills requirements, uh, the need to, of course, capacitate our learners and our teachers uh, 
to be 4.0 ready as well, as well as uh, equipping our private institutions with the technologies and the equipment to be uh, to be 4.0 ready. So these are contained in this framework, and uh, we will also revisit this framework to make uh, this also uh, adaptive to the new normal. So, under this uh, framework, of course, uh, we would like to highlight uh, the efforts that we're moving, uh, that we are doing, especially in the area of uh, identification of skills requirements, not only for the present and the future. We are uh, in partnership with the Skills Future of Singapore, uh, together with the Department of Trade and Industry in terms of uh, human capital development. And uh, this will help us define the present and future skills requirement of the, uh, the different industries. And we are being supported by, by Skills Future Singapore in this effort. And we are also looking at uh, developing our standards, competency standards, which is the basis for training and assessment, adapting this to international uh, standards and ensuring that they are also adapted to our local requirements and including our curriculum and our teachers and our training institutions. So moving forward, uh, our future uh, requirements, of course, will highlight the need for more innovations, more capacity building, more improvements in our infrastructures, and uh, as even as mentioned earlier, uh, we need to really change our mindsets, not only for, for policy makers, but also for our teachers and our learners to be uh, future ready. Uh, we will submit our formal position on this, uh, Madam Chair, to detail on the various initiatives that we are doing. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, may I ask next next hearing? Can you give us examples? No, maganda yung framework, pero I'd like to see um, actual examples of like what are the jobs of the futures that you foresee based on uh, your own studies, discussions you've had with industries, and how uh, within your level uh, are you able to, um, at what point will you be able to start training our, our youth in these fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I also happen to be the author uh, of the, um, the, I forgot the name of the law, who can refresh my memory, Ladderize, there you go, Ladderize Education. Oh, yeah. So dapat kasama din sa inyo we don't have time now, but can you um, discuss that in the future, in the next hearing? Okay. We'll be happy to do that, Madam Chair. Thank you very yes. much. Yes. Okay. So we only have um, about 19 minutes left. So, and I, if you notice, I'm trying not to rush the speakers because I really want us to learn from this. No. So again, my apologies to, to many who will not be able to speak today, but uh, I will give you your time and I hope that you prefer that I'm not rushing you rather than uh, rushing everybody tas wala naman tayong uh, naintindihan na sa sa ganda ng mga sasabihin niyo eh minadali kayo no so dr jenny hoxson is the next uh, she's the vp for academics of pnu so please proceed dr jenny and then um uh, i will call on the next person after that good afternoon let's keep, yeah. uh, let's afternoon, keep it short let me just say though if i can accommodate three or four more speakers try to keep it short but if there are questions of course we will entertain questions go ahead uh jenny good afternoon madam chair good afternoon everyone uh from the pnu perspective as the national center for teacher education all of our plans for the future will always be determined by the industry and that is the department of education it is uh, heartwarming to listen to you, Zagnepo, on all of the plans for the future, future's thinking. The idea from the Philippine Normal University is to build on a teacher's academy that is evidence-based and standards-based, which I believe uh, Madam Chair has, has, has understood from uh, the other um, Senate hearing on basic education. So the idea of the standards-based is to ensure that there's a roadmap to train our teachers from the pre-service to the in-service um, uh, training and uh, practice. Uh, the plan also for the Teachers Academy is to be able to respond well to the industry, to what the industry needs. And this is where the link 
between the Department of Education and CHED comes in to ensure that there is a strengthened link between the two. And finally, Madam Chair, the idea of addressing lifelong learning as teachers, and I've heard this in the presentations early on, uh, the teachers keep on seg segmenting the idea of learning and segmenting the idea of life. Learning is a holistic context that um, at PNU would like to, to continue to develop to nurture innovative teachers and school leaders. So the very idea of Teachers Academy, Madam Chair, is to do a lifelong learning that is evidence-based and industry responsive. The roadmap between the pre-service and the in-service is quickly aligned in the expectations of the standards set by the industry and to ensure that our curriculum is responding to what the Department of Education intends to do. So if DepEd would like to move along the not segmented subjects, then the courses for the pre-service must be able to respond to that. Not only the multi-literacies, but the inter dependence of the literacies across. So, uh, Madam Chair, we will submit, PNU will submit our proposal on Teachers Academy to link all of the systems from the pre-service to the in-service. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much. I, I note your comment about um, your, that PNU is simply aligning no, with the direction of DepEd. So when, when um, USECNAP is still here, I assume, no? Um, uh, NEPO pala, sorry, not NAP. Um, NEPO. NEPO. Um, can, can we just have a, I don't, don't give me a response anymore siguro, but I want to be sure na nangyayari yun. Kasi when you yes, say, na, when, when you say that, um, the curriculum, uh, is already there, but it's the, uh, the teachers and their training that have to catch up. Well, that's precisely what we need to ensure. And we're already talking to PNU sa lagay na yun. Or what about oh, all oh. the other colleges that produce teachers no uh, um, would you know would you know um dr jenny if itong mga schools na to are adjusting nga dun sa mga multidisciplinary approach sa pagtuturo ito dito the, sa across, um yeah thank you madam chair the concern right now is that there's no direct link between the department of education and the commission on higher education there's the gap there the curriculum uh, are, are not aligned the training are not aligned uh, but, but we think at PNU, we think that the, that the industry is the Department of Education, meaning we're training for them. So the alignment must be strong between the pre-service uh, mapping to what the expectations of the Department of Education is. In the case of PNU, because we are the lead shepherd of the National Network of Normal Schools, and we are a, a, a convener of the Philippine uh, Teacher Education Network, which is composed of centers of excellence and centers of development, then the moving forward and the link to all of them are coming along that line. So we're addressing all of these concerns, Madam Chair, but uh, at the same time, we're also ensuring that we are providing a bigger perspective, a bigger notion of, of, uh, of training our teachers other than that of the expectations of the Department of Education. But as regards where, uh, where the TEIs are in terms of alignment with the, with DepEd. We're going there, Madam Chair, but we need the insurance that um, CHED, because we have deliverables to CHED, that CHED will be able to align fully in what the industry expects. No? And the PRC, Madam Chair, is also something that we have to look into because we are sometimes teaching to the test because the test is different from what the expectations of the Department of Education is so um as regards uh, pnu and deped madam chair we are part of the sulung edukalidad uh, so we are ensuring that the national network of normal schools and the philippine association of teacher education network network is moving alongside the expectations of the department of education okay thank you so much for that um we will take note of that you including what you said about um prc and then uh, i understand that um uh, Dep also, Dep also made comments on a few other things, but that's for the future. Thank you so much. Let me move forward. Ideally, I'd like to be able to call two or three pe people. Thank you for keeping that short. Um, uh, and let me now call on um, Dr. Napoleon Juanillo, um, founder and convener of Institutes for Research, Innovation, and Scholarships. And then after that would be Christine Reyes of... Uh, CIMU, Southeast Asian Ministry of Educational Organizations. All right, so Dr. Uh, Juanillo, please.
Is Dr. Juanillo in? If Dr. Juanillo is not in, I will call on um, Ms. Christine Reyes first. Mr. Ms. Christine Reyes, why don't you take the floor first? Uh, Christine Reyes, Director of Aptissimi Development Innovations, Consultant at Southeast Asian Ministry of Educational Organizations. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Christine Reyes. Uh, can, I, can you hear me, Senator? Yes. Yes, I can, can, yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Simeo Inotech, where I am a consultant, we do online uh, courses for teachers and uh, school heads in Southeast Asia. So this topic is very important to us because currently we're, we're doing a strategic thinking and innovation and developing managerial leadership. So in terms of the new normal, I just like to say that our current educational system has been based on the second <clears throat> industrial revolution and we're moving now to the fourth. So we're really very far behind. And uh, in terms of uh, the challenges we have, if we design the future that we want to have in terms of our educational system, uh, the COVID is actually an opportunity for us to shift from where we are to where we want to go. So right now, everything is very top down. It's the central office providing the guidance and the direction to the schools. But our premise is our current realities does not really lead to our being able to adapt to the new normal. Uh, we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of um, difficulties in terms of resources and schedule. So right now, what do we need to do? Uh, in a presentation that I sent or some data from uh, the Department of Education that shows uh, it's really impossible right now to do online because uh, the students have not been surveyed and it's the students who do not have the resources to go online really, especially those at the rural areas. So uh, there's a slide in slide number six. Uh, we look at the, how do we design a more responsive educational delivery given the new COVID? And uh, there are four areas. Uh, we'd like to look at the school context, uh, teacher competencies, resources needed at home, and support needed by the school. So right now, all of the things, uh, many of the things here are not available for us. So it's really a challenge to go to the dreams that we have in the future if our current realities are not yet there. So uh, what is it that we need to do? We need to be able to help the schools design their own delivery system. I know it's difficult right now because DepEd's uh, frame is that it's from the central office down to the schools, from the region to the division to the district. However, it's the school who knows best how delivery systems can be done because they know the students, they know how proximate they are to the schools, they know um, where, how many students they need. So for us to be able to start the small step towards the future, we need to decentralize design and decision making. We need to help the teachers. Right now, there's only 9% of teachers that were surveyed by DepEd who know how to do instructional design. So that's a lot of, that. that's a very big gap for them to shift right now. So to allow us, um, to do this, the consideration is uh, delivery. We should base it on the school context at the bottom. For curriculum, we base it on the concepts that we need to learn and the life skills. For support systems, we need the family and the community because if you have a homeschool situation, the parents have to be there to supervise. So I don't know if parents can really afford it right now. And then uh, to design the delivery system, we need a very good uh, principal and teachers working with parents and stakeholders. Currently, we don't have any best practice because uh, COVID has just happened now, but we have models to choose from. We have uh, homeschooling, we have ALS, 
And we have, for example, in uh, Simeo Inutec, we've identified some schools like Novotas National High School, San Pedro Relocation National High School, uh, the Bernidos in their dynamic learning systems, teaching sciences that have, have pockets of success already. But it's not because of COVID, so we need to kind of uh, check and uh, adapt it. So for the new normal, the objective is designing our future starting today. Uh, we want it to be, we want our schools and teachers to be, uh, school heads to be agile, resilient, responsive, and all of this will result in sustainable development. We want to move forward to the third and the fourth industrial re revolution, and this is the opportunity right now. So we need to change competencies. We need to change the way that we operate our educational system. It's a challenge, but this is, I think, a very opportune time for us to do so. So my shift, I mean, the dreams are all there, but how to put it in operation is really the challenge. And I think we need to begin now. That's it. Thank you for that. And keeping it short, but um, please, please attend our next hearing again, no? Because I have a lot of questions, but I'd like to save it na lang for later. I'd also like to get Dep Ed's reaction later on, because medyo na surprise ako dun sa statement na we are um anion, we are our, our curriculum is based on the second industrial revolution. In fact, Dep Ed, I forgot lang kanina, so I, I I want to interject as soon as I hear something. Um. There's this very interesting uh, research, um, and it's it's actually a um, podcast, I believe, um, on the state of the math curriculum in the U.S. U.S. na to, no? And apparently, um, um, the conclusion is their math curriculum is um, based on the 1900s, the early turn of the century pa, 1900, early 1900s. That's the U.S. Ano pa kaya yung sa atin, no? Assuming we mirror them, di siguro we're around that same level. But the competencies might even be lower. No, that, so so that's what I want to discuss next time. We don't have time now, but can you please note my concerns and let's discuss that later on. Um, we have a whole number of um, Metro Bank awardees, and uh, my team only allocated a few minutes. But I I beg to um, I beg for your indulgence because I do not want to cut short uh, these great ideas coming from these people. And since I only have four minutes before I leave, I think what I would do now is just as um, Principal Dr. George Tison of uh, Taguig City, because it resonates with the messaging um, just now, no? Na, uh, we need to empower and in a way localize, no? uh, decentralize the decision making. Because in Taguig City, in as much itong school ni um, Dr. George, in as much as it is a deaf ed public school, I think uh, Taguig has tried to empower the, the school very much, and they're able to come up with a lot of innovation. So, Dr. Tizon, mga two to three minutes lang, pwede naman continue that sa next hearing natin. Please explain na lang yung inyong uh, program on uh, on um, cyber cyber learning bank tawag niya. Please proceed. Dr. George Tizon, are you there? Cannot hear you. George? Uh, good afternoon, Madam Senator. Good afternoon, everyone. In the city okay. of Taguig, we have this program, what we call the TORCH program from the city government of Taguig. Ta a TORCH stands for uh, Taguig Online Resources and Community Hub. It's an umbrella program uh, that concerns uh, primarily the two educational programs called the Cyber Lab at Home. The Cyber Lab at Home is an online training for our teachers. Uh, Madam Senator, we prepare our public school teachers for online training, for homeschooling. Around 4,500 of them already went uh, training, underwent training uh, for the last four weeks, and they're about to graduate, making them prepared for the homeschooling for the new normal, together with 1,000 uh, private school teachers to make sure that our approach is inclusive in the city of Tagui. Another program, uh, Madam Senator, is the Tech Talk program or the training and enrichment courses from Taguig Online Campus. It's an online uh, training program for all Taguig residents, which we provide uh, 
for our residents in order for them uh, to have an online training while they are staying at home during the quarantine period. And uh, once uh, the Taguig residents uh, registered in this uh, Tech Talk online program, they will be given access to more than 250 courses, different courses online, provided by the Skills of Company, a worldwide known uh, e-learning company. And uh, all this program is because of our preparations and the foundations that we built in, in, in making sure that the public education in the city of Taguig uh, will stand and uh, will will meet the challenges, especially now that we are facing the COVID pandemic. And uh, of course, our public schools are 100% Wi-Fi uh, 